Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. I'm so happy to see so many people here. That's cool. So we'll start with an experiment. Are you ready for that? Let's stand up. It's morning, right? So you need to move anyway. Now, imagine an organization of your dreams. How does it look like? What kind of values are there? How it feels? And now, compare it to the organization where you work. Right? You've got that comparison in your mind. Now, if that's very different, two pictures, nothing to do with each other, you can sit down. Honest people, ah, congratulations to you. About one-fourth of you, ah. Now, if it's similar, but still not the same, you can sit down. Ah. And now we have about 15 people who work in the organization of their dream. Well, congratulations to you. Ah, you can sit down. So this talk is about agile leadership, right? And I started with a story to make it a little bit more personal. And the story starts in one summer day, 2010. When I've been asked to form a new department out of three original ones, testers, developers, and hardware guys, with a goal of build some highly flexible, collaborative environment with innovations, creativity, and things like that, right? So I went home. I was really surprised because I haven't expected to get three departments from out of nowhere, right? So my first thinking was like, wow, I can make a difference. I can change the world. I can do whatever I want to. And then it got me. I imagine there's 120 people coming to my office every day, asking all of those questions. What shall I do with it? Can you decide on that? Can you approve this? Can I buy a new chair? Can I get a new computer? Can I get a new position? Can I get a pay raise? Can you approve my holidays? And I felt tired and overwhelmed by that. And I started thinking maybe, maybe that I should just give up and just forget that crazy idea of self-organizing teams and no management and just, you know, choose a couple of people and build that traditional structure of hierarchy. I went sleep. And the morning brought new light and the new energy. And I finally find the courage to present next week at the executive meeting the brand new structure based on self-organizing teams and no management. To tell you a little bit more about the context. So our chairman was an old man around his 60s. He was very formal, always wearing a suit, kind of a short guy with a no hair, low voice, giving an impression that he's always right, so you don't argue with him. You know, very formal person. And so next week, I was ready for uh, my presentation, you know, to show the structure. He's been clearly in a good mood, joking with everyone sitting up front, and then he started a meeting, saying, oh, we are all happy to know about your management structure and what do you want to do with that new engineering department? Oh, let me start my presentation. Oh my God, no managers, I don't have any. Uh, whoa, what should I? All right, so let me start. But before I tell you what I have in mind, I want you to think back about why are we doing this change. We wanted to get a high flexibility department which would serve our customers' needs, be ready to serve our customers with all those changes we are dealing with, be highly collaborative, brings innovations, kind of a modern top technology place where a company, where people would like to work with. Is that correct? Okay. So, I did a research, 
And I were, I talk with a similar kind of companies and find out that there is a structure which would fit this need. And so um, you see here over the screen that maybe actually we can build it on a self-organization, collaboration, and no management structure in this department. No managers, huh? Yes, no managers, because uh, no managers means actually enabler for this uh, high collaborative space with a flexibility and, and so on. And, and actually it's grounded from the agile idea we are already implementing. Oh, so you want to make it agile, huh? Um, yes, agile, because... Hmm, okay, so let's try it. After all, that's the reason why we choose you, because uh, we want to be the modern organization. And he continues like that. I actually don't have a clue. Why did he choose to say yes to my crazy idea of a flat structure with a self-organizing team and no managers? Because he's been struggling with that from that time on. It was against his kind of DNA, the way he was. And I think that might be the reason was that I link it to the real strategic reason. Then I actually told them that's the way how to achieve something bigger. I didn't say I want to have it agile. I love flat organization. I've been reading this book and that could be awesome. Somebody told me that agile is great. I said we need a higher flexibility. So that's my first tip here. Agile is not your goal. It's actually just the way how to achieve your goals. And I'm very often saying it's just the best way. Nowadays, in a complex world, and I truly believe in it, but I keep it up to you. So don't start just because you want to be agile, because you're going to fail. But if you start, that's where most of the organization starts. It's a traditional structure with all the hierarchy, the manager, and manager, and manager, and manager, and manager, and manager, employee, somewhere below. And then when you implement change, you start usually here, some team spirit, some Kanban-ish team, some scrum, some self-organization, some agile practices, those kind of yellow bubbles of agility, of a different way of working. And the more you do those experiments with a different way of working, the more you actually create a disconnect between the traditional structures. So sooner or later, you end up like this, a washing machine kind of thing. But you have the traditional black dot structure disconnected from the yellow one, but it's so much fast changing and disconnected and kind of moving around and around and around. So, it's not really fun to be there. Those managers in this type of organization, they say, well, I like this team, you know, I like that they are faster, I like they are delivering. Then all those chairmen said, he likes it. But at the same time, he hates it. Because he was like, oh, what, what, who is responsible there, right? So it was against his nature. So the most common question was like, who is responsible? And I, my usual answer was like, the team is. He doesn't like it. So I said, no, 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 no. The team can't be responsible. Who is responsible? So my second answer was, I'm responsible because eventually, from legal perspective, I'm a manager, so I'm responsible, right? No, no, you can't be responsible for everything. And eventually I thought, eventually, if we go really far away, you're responsible because the chairman of the board after all, but I didn't say that, right? So that kind of a disconnect of looking uh, for answers which are actually quite unimportant in the new world. An inability to have a real kind of sense like how is it working. So that was really interesting to see him. I've been trying to help him to be part of it, but it was a really hard journey for him. And it was getting worse. But after all, my second tip here, right? It's all about you. Now, disclaimer up front, 
there is no equal between the manager and the leader. There are two different things. The manager is a person who's got the stars over here, you know, appointed to the role, voted to the role as a president, for example. But the leader is a state of mind. Anyone here from you can be a leader. And the only thing which is in between of you and you being a leader is this decision. I want to be a leader. I'm ready to take over the responsibility. I'm ready to take it with all the possible risks. But I decide to move that move, stand here and say, OK, how about to do this? How about if I organize a conference? How about if I run this open space meeting? How about if I try this new innovation product? Come up with your own idea, but leaders have to change first. If you change first your own mindset, the others will follow. So that's the secret kind of thing, how to do it. Help others to be there. And if you're successful with it, you have this nice click. You remember those washing machine, you know, those yellow and black dots? They click together. And now it's the quiet after the storm. It just works seamlessly without any issue. It's constantly changing and moving somewhere and coming up with new ideas, but it's somehow a harmony would be part of it from one day to another, pretty much, without noticing. It's a collaborative, creative, adaptive network, right? But a metaphor for this type of organization would be a living system. You know, you have your hands. They are pretty much independent. You can move like this. But you can't do that one hand is going there and the other one is going there. It's just impossible. They are somehow connected, right? So the same thing here. There's teams and clusters of teams are somehow connected with others through the social connectiveness. They are not independent completely. However, they have autonomy to make decisions. They learn from their failures. They learn from their successes. And also, you can see it as an analogy of a traditional organization being a huge tanker boat with a centralized decision-making process. While the agile organization is a flotilla of small boats which can decide by themselves, are we going to here or here or here or here? We have the same mission. Same purpose to achieve, but we are pretty much independent. Not completely, but pretty much. So that's the Agile organization. Now, how to build it, right? Because it's somehow you just need to achieve that click. So that's how it looks from inside. That's the culture picture of it. The culture is a kind of a clam, right? That kind of a sea creature, which is like moving like that. That's still the good thing. And then it might be and click. Or if you break it down, the organization is dead. It has those two parts. One is a structure. The other one is a mindset. The structure is about all those decision-making things, the strategy, the tactics, the power. Structure. Reverts. Position. Pair roles, right? Or the career path, all of those things. Rules, governance, guidance, politics, processes, all of those things. It's a kind of a soil. If you make it too strict and too tight, nothing will grow up from the other part. And it's kind of dead, closed, not moving, no life. If you make it too free and empty, then you create a chaos and eventually it breaks down. So we are looking for a balance of all those two parts. The mindset is more about the behavior, kind of ownership and self-organization and responsibility, trust. This 
belief that people are good, the collaboration, the safety, openness, transparency. But also in the middle there is that star, which is actually the most important part of that mindset. Without it, it doesn't work. So organizational purpose, sometimes we say evolutionary purpose, that's how all those small boats fit together. That's how all those small teams are tied together. Of course they have their identity and values and beliefs, but you must have one goal. That's the glue. That's how we all have the same direction. We want to achieve that. It's like a star on the horizon. You never touch it, you can get closer. But you never reach there. And actually there is no one way how to get there. You don't know. It can be this way or that way. Inspect and adapt, experiment, right? So that's the core of it. So if you have a right balance, those two things are constantly kind of moving and create a harmony and it works. So that's the culture we are speaking about. There is no one way where to start. So sometimes companies are asking like, where should we start? Should we start with a structure or a mindset? Well, it doesn't matter. You have to start somewhere and do a tiny single step and then see what happened with the other part and do the other change and another change and another change and another change. A balance. So most of the managers, when you speak about those type of things, right, those traditional managers who's been living in a traditional organization most of their lives, they have this head like a square, like saying, eh, I like it, I like it, but I, I don't know what to do. That was our chairman, right? He likes certain aspects of what we created, but he's got a, such a big discomfort. He just can't get it. And I think one of those reasons why executives and senior managers have troubles to understand what we are doing here with transforming into agile is because they never worked in an agile team. They don't have their own hands-on experience. So one of those things is, how can we help them to get that experience? And it's unlikely that they would, you know, go back to the development team and code or test. It rarely happens. So how can, what else can we do to bring them along? And one of those things is that there is always an executive team. So how about if we run it in an agile, scrummy way? If we give them that experience, what does it mean to iterate? Every month deliver something which brings value. Wow. Do we really have to deliver something every month? We've been so busy. The first question you hear, right? Oh, do we really have to have this? Is it really important? Hey, do you want it for your guys down there or not? So how about if you just start doing exactly the same thing which they do? kind of get along very well. So give them that opportunity to try it. Because after all, everyone in the organization needs to have a hands-on experience on the team collaboration and this kind of self-organization. You can't lead a self-organizational entity if you've never been a part of any self-organizing team. It just doesn't work. It doesn't have to be a team which is doing the code or software, but it can be any other team. It could be volunteer group which is organizing this conference, right? It doesn't matter, but you need a hands-on experience. And then about the leadership. So uh, this model pretty much shows what you need to do. The central piece is a system. So you should look at the organization from a top from a system perspective and see it all together. Ah, nice. And the first piece is a get awareness. So learn how to listen. There is not just one single voice. There are like thousands of different voices. People disagreeing with each other. People supporting each other. People laughing. People frustrated. Feel the energy. Feel all that. Observe, listen, and feel. 
And once you learn how to do that, once you learn how to look at things from all the different perspectives and be curious, and how does it look like from here? And how does it look like from there? Oh, that's very different. Oh, well, how fascinating. Then you're ready to move to the next one. Very rarely you say, oh, how fascinating. Because you trust the system and you understand it in a way and you kind of acknowledge that you can't judge it because from this perspective it might be good, from that perspective it might not. It's so complex that it's so hard to say. So once you got okay with it and kind of feel okay, well, that's our organization. That's how it feels, behaves. That's us. And I'm okay with it. Only then you're ready to change it. And this change, act upon, there is a lot of coaching involved, but uh, in general, it's not about big change like those traditional managers often feel. We implement Agile tomorrow. Right? Not like that. It's more about, hey, how about you do this? Click. 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 Tiny, small things. And then you go back, right, and get awareness again. What my question started, or what is one collaborative workshop initiated? What can I see, or hear, or feel from the space? And then, once you are there long enough, you move next to the get awareness and kind of accept it and embrace it and feel okay. Ah, oh, that's good. I'm okay with it. Okay, well, that's what's happening here. Hmm. How fascinating, right? And then again, click, get awareness, embrace it, and click again. Never ending process. Because there is one kind of belief in, in all that agile space that there is no best way to exist. There are different ways how we can work with each other, so we need to constantly adapt and move ahead. If you look at a system, organization as a system, there are three rules. One is listen to the voice of a system. Be open to hear them all. The second one, who knows what is right and what is not. So if you hear all those voices, they would be contradicting to each other. I love this. I hate it. And I think that was really bad. Oh, that was fun. Of the same one thing. How is that possible, right? So who knows what is right and what is not? Maybe that because we've got this bug last week, which was actually causing our systems to be down for two days. So we lost some money, by the way, because people can't buy our products and you know our integrity is broken, etc. Maybe. It looks like really bad even. But maybe it was actually a good thing because it happened in the middle of summer where, to tell you the truth, no one is really buying too much in the middle of summer. And as a result of that, we make some changes so we make sure it will never happen to us again, maybe in the middle of Christmas period where it would be killing to our revenues. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? In a way, it was a bad thing because it should never happen. On the other hand, it was a great thing because the risk of going out of a business was pretty small, middle of summer, right? But we learned from it, so it was actually great. We learned and the learning was still cheap. Like this, right? So anything which is happening to you is not good or bad in a complex world. In a complex world, you don't, we don't know. And there is the last one, there's the positivity in it, right? That everyone out of those all thousand voices is right, but only partially. There is always 2% of truth on every different perspective. And if you look at things that way, only then you're ready to really run that, you know, act upon, embrace, and change circle and see the organization 
from the system perspective. And that's a mental process. It's not about processes, it's not about measurements, it's not about rules, it's not about governance. It's about you and your way of thinking. And this is a competence model, what you need to have as an agile leader. And of course, each of us is, has its own strengths somewhere and our own weaknesses somewhere else. That will happen any time. But it's good to have a look at those and have your own internal assessment once I'm describing this. So I would start from a top, that kind of a bigger wedge on the top, starting with a vision. So after all, as a leader, you must have a vision. What do I want to change? What do I want to achieve? And if the vision is like evolutionary purpose appealing thing, when you start talking about it with all the energy around this, people say, oh, wow, okay, I'm joining you. Can I help you with that? Yeah, do you need somebody who could help you with this? What can I do for you? Can I work for this company? Like that, right? Can I join your team? So the vision is part of the motivation over there, which is much more intrinsic motivation coming from internal belief than extrinsic. So vision, motivation, and the third one is a feedback. Most of us, managers specifically, but I would say it's a human nature kind of thing. So most of us, sometimes we feel we are good at giving feedback, right? We are open and fair. But how many times you got a feedback from your peers and learn from it? How many times the managers out of you got a feedback from your employees bottom up and learn from it? How open were you to listen to those comments? How many times you really deeply think about that? And how many times you said, oh yeah, it's his opinion. I just do it my way because of blah, blah, blah. Solved, forgotten. Think about it. So feedback is about giving feedback to the others, but I don't think that's so important. I think it's much more important to be able to receive a feedback and learn from it. Over here, decide and collaborate. So sometimes people say in agile space you don't decide, right? That's not true. After all, at some cases, you just have to make a decision. Because someone has to make a decision. So do it. That's OK. In traditional world, there are two different couples. We have a decision-making process and delegation. So somebody else decides. In agile, it's not that much about delegation. It's actually about collaboration. So are you able to collaborate with the people around you? How many times you bring people along and say, hey, let's do it together and see what happens? So decide and collaborate. It's all about you, what you do as a leader. On the other side of a spectrum is a coaching and facilitation, those two soft skills which we should all have. And those two are very different by nature because they're not about you anymore. They're about the others. So as a leader who is standing on this side, it's not about me. But I trust you that you're going to make it. My ultimate goal would be to be almost invisible. Just make the environment that way so you make it happen. That's how those other leaders are grown. And over here on the bottom, you have the change. Change is always hard. And my experience is that the hardest is change of yourself, of your habits, of your behavior. I'll give you some very short you know, example, simple example. I want to go running, right? Because, you know, I used to be more slim and now I don't feel that good anymore. So it would be conscious decision. Let's go running. I'm having this conversation with myself for about two years now. How many times do you think I've been running? Twice. For two years. And I'm really good at finding excuses. I'm not. 
the same thing, right? We need to be more open to the customers. And we need to search for feedback. And then you go to the sprint review and do the presentation and tell them, hey, it is what it is. And don't ask for any feedback. And you feel good about it because there was no bad feedback. It takes a time until we change because it's hard-coded in our brains. We need to change our habits. And back to the previous picture, one of the reasons why we change it, why I'm not running, is actually I don't have such a, a more important reason. I think if I go to the physician and they would tell me, hey, you know what, unless you start running, you're going to be dead in half a year, I'm sure I would be running every day, no matter what. Right? It's just about the purpose. I'm not that fat yet, so it's still okay, right? <laughs> so the purpose is one of those key things. If you don't have it, nothing will save you. No processes, no tools, no frameworks. Forget them. They are useless unless you have a strong evolutionary purpose. Change them, right? That's the coaching kind of facilitation thing where you use the groups and help them to change. And then eventually change the system. There's a system perspective. Again, large group facilitation, system coachings are the tools which are useful here. Look at the organization from the system perspective. There is a great book called Reinventing Organizations. And uh, Frederick Laloux describes the organizational structure pretty much in a colors, right? So he's got his red, orange, uh, and uh, um, amber. And those are those fixed structures. They are very traditional kind of thing. Either the steep hierarchy like in the army, or maybe on the other edge, the metric structure of a learning organization where everybody has a kind of ability to be successful and be an expert on something. But it's still a very fixed structure. It's still a traditional mindset. Because we believe we can make a decision and stay with it. We can do the analysis and decide how the organization should be structured and just keep it. In an agile space, very often we use some kind of a dynamic structures. So the green one, the green organization, the typical example of a green is a Spotify. It's a defined structure, which is kind of flexible and changing by definition based on self-organization. But they still have those squads and tribes and guilds. Right? So they still have a structure there. Structure exists. And then you have those teal organizations, which are driven by the evolutionary purpose. They are like this, really, the network, the flotilla of those boats, and they don't have any structure. It's a liquid structure. Hey, I've got this idea. How about if we do this? And if the enough people say, yes, we help you, we go with you, you just go and do it. You inspect and adapt on the way, so very soon you say, oh, OK, doesn't work. Let's go back. Or you say, wow, that's actually cool. Do you want to join us? Hey, go here. We just try it, and it's really working. Come on. And then somebody else would say, hey, I want to try this. Do you want to follow? And the people say, uh, no. Well, they say, OK. Then the people say, yeah. Then they follow, and they split, and then join, and split, and it's kind of a distributed thing, liquid structure. One day you are a leader of something, the other day you are a team member of something else. So that's the company where they don't really have a manager. They have a strong leadership. By the way, the strongest leadership. Here, in red orange, they have a strong managers, right? And usually very little leadership. In green, it's like half half. In the teal, it's like 95% of leadership, 5% of management. So that's the difference. And just to remind you about the difference, every one of you is a leader. It's just your decision if you want to be. The last thing, help others to become leaders and support the weak culture. Right? It's up to you. 
Do you want to help others to step out and say, hey, how about if we do this? Will you help me? Are you able to create an environment like this or not? And again, there is a book. It's called Turn the Ship Around. And it's written by the captain of a US Navy submarine. And it's an interesting story because companies are often saying, yeah, I read this, but that company was different. We can't apply this. Of course you can apply it. You have to grow it from the bottom. But then I usually tell them, OK, so how about this book? If they've been successful as implementing it, on a US Navy submarine, quite critical environment. Well, do you still believe you can't? Do you still believe this corporation is more difficult than that? No, well, maybe not, right? So the question here is like, how can you help others to be leaders? And what David Market says is that there are two types of leadership. On the one hand, you have a leader follower. That's those red orange organizations. You have a manager, they're given orders, and the others follow, right? On the other hand, you have this leader leader, which is a partnership of a equally important adult. And here, you have an option. How can we deal with each other? Because we all have the right to make decisions. And this story started from his own experience. He's been once you know, chosen to be a captain on a submarine after some experience in the Navy. And as a captain for the submarine, you have to study for two years every single technical detail of that one particular submarine you are going to be appointed. So he's been studying for one year and a half. And then they told me, oh, David, sorry, you know, you're not going to that submarine, which is very new. You're actually going to that submarine, which is very old, and with a very demotivated crew, one of our worst in the Navy. He said, well, you know, I, I can't. I just, you know, I've been trained for that type, and this type has, like, nothing to do with that one. And they say, well, you know, you still have six months to go, so do your best. So he said, okay, well, I do my best. So he did his best and really tried to learn and read and, you know, fill the gaps. Someday, right before he was supposed to be appointed there as a captain, he went for a test ride. So he's been standing in a control room, giving the order, right? And he said something in a, I, I forgot the exact name of that thing, but something like, turn the switch A. The commandant next to him said, like, turn the switch A. And then finally the person in the control room said, turn the switch A. It didn't change anything. So he's like, why didn't you change anything? Just like, sorry, sir, but there is no switch A exist in this submarine. Why didn't you say anything? Did you know that? Yes, sir. Why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you tell me? You give us an order, and the order is the order we follow. I was like, okay. So here, here it is, right? He thought. I can't give orders because there is a like chance that I will get another order like this, and this time it would be a problem. So what he said is like, okay, I have to do it differently. And he's been trained to do this leader leader model before, so he decided to do it. And eventually he's been successful. It was a very painful journey. Extremely painful, by the way. And through that time, he learned how to grow people so they became leaders. They invented something which said, be really transparent about your intentions, right? So everybody needs to know what you're going to do. So they can stop you if that's not a good idea. We all need to know the radical transparency, right? Think about the organization. How many of you have that radical transparency? 
it's sometimes frightening because you know what what if they know well what if they know at least they make a good decision right so all of their crew was eventually saying i intend to do this this and that right and at the beginning he didn't have that trust yet so he's been asking all of those questions did you think about this how about that how about this how about this the answer and eventually he said yes do it and Sooner or later, he actually realized that they came up with better ideas than he's got in mind. And that one, that one thing is actually quite successful. Eventually, in a couple of years, this submarine became the most well-rated submarine in the U.S. Navy. And also, that crew became the highest promoted to be a captain's or a higher leadership uh, on the other submarines, so quite successful. He is now not in the Navy anymore. He wrote a book and traveling the world talking about his experience. Very interesting guy. But if you believe we can't do it in our organization because of blah, 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 well, read it and think about what he did. Because I can't imagine about more Mission Impossible place than this one. And here I make you this summary about the three tips. Uh, first of all, Agile is not your goal. It's just the way how to achieve your goals. Keep it in mind, because if you break that, you're going to fail. You're not implementing Agile because of Agile. You're not implementing Agile because I just said it's the best way. You're implementing it because you need to achieve something. I need to know how otherwise you would. So it's a strategic reason for that. And um, the second thing is that leaders need to change first. So it's all on you. You can do it. The next day, when you show up at your work, on Monday, maybe, after you think about it over the weekend, well, maybe you can make a difference. Maybe you can change something. Maybe you can approach things from a different perspective and take over the responsibility and make a difference. And maybe you can help others to become leaders. Maybe it doesn't have to be all about you. Maybe that enabler factor, help others to grow, is quite important as well. I wrote this book uh, about a year ago. It's a practical guide for who, who want to improve their teams and organizations. So, uh, and I brought a couple of copies here, so I'll be sitting somewhere outside if you want to get some. And so we have some bookstore over there later on. It's called The Great Scrum Master. And uh, you're free to connect with me on any of those channels. And I have still about roughly 15 minutes to answer some questions. I learned people are asking questions after this talk, so I hope you will ask as well. Otherwise, I end up too early. Any questions? So thanks, Susie. And yeah, we have uh, actually only one mic, so please Raise a hand if you some have some questions, and I will get to you. By the way, that book about ship, I also have read it. Actually, uh, not read, but audio book. So it's really great, and also I recommend that good book. So any questions? Yeah, we have one. Yeah, I can break the ice. Thanks a lot for sharing. Um, you mentioned Spotify as an example of a green organization. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any teal organizations in your experience? I have one uh, example of a Czech company which I've seen uh, because I knew those people for 15 years now. And out of the uh, very international ones, it would be the Valve, Morningstar, and companies like that 
I would say that uh, I share a story from that one Czech company. It's interesting because I've been always kind of a hat. I've been studying with those guys. They started a web studio. You know, typical thing. We all study some computer science, so they started a small web studio. And that was really interesting because at a certain point of a time, like two years from that, they said, those three owners, you know, we read some book, and I still don't know which kind of book it was. I, I, I never asked, and I don't think they would remember it. But we thought we can be really the leaders of that organization, the managers of that organization, so we decided to hire a manager and step out. And at that time, I was still studying the university. I was unable to understand this. I was like, why? You have your own company, and you are hiring somebody above you as a manager, and you are just somewhere lower in a hierarchy? So that was the first time when I heard, oh, that's weird. I don't get it. I was deeply in a, you know, there I want to be, you know, senior, 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 whatever else, right, the company's been offering, right? And then, at certain point about here, five years after, They've been saying, oh, we actually, we are not agile company. They didn't call it agile. They say we are free company. We don't have a managers. I was like, ah, that's a bullshit. No managers. Come on. What does it even mean, no managers, right? You still need somebody who would lead something and give a direction, right? And now, five years after, I am staying here speaking about the same thing they've already got in mind five years ago. So that's kind of interesting that sometimes um, when you hear about those concepts, you feel like, I don't get it. It's come some crazy thing. Because you look at it from your own perspective of the things you know. And to tell you how does it look like now, they came up with a bigger group. They are not just a web studio anymore. Well, actually, for a couple of years now. They have a one big group, which consists of several smaller companies, which are always focusing somewhere. And one of those smaller companies is actually run by one of my, again, friends who's been studying with me at that time. He's been an employee of that company from the time we've been at the university. And now he is a CEO of one of those things. So I asked him, hey, how it happened. And he was like, you hey, know, we've got with those two people an idea that we want to do also something else with a big data and things like that. And it was a different business than our original company. So we did some research, came up with a business case and proposal. And eventually the owners of the group said yes. And we started a new company, which is co-owned by us as a three initiators and the group as well. So that's interesting, right? Because they even allow them to run their own business. I have another company. It's actually a company from, from Russia, from Moscow. Scrum track, maybe? I'm not sure. So um, they run, uh, they got about 20 people. They've been having a talk about it at the Agile Pra conference, which I organized. And they said they switched a year ago to have an open salaries and kind of really flat structure where everybody is deciding about everything else. They increase the radical transparency. So everybody sees everything, including all the money in, all the money out. If you want to pay a raise, you have to ask all your colleagues. If I ask them how is it working, they say, well, it's a very painful process. We like it in a way, but it's really painful because when you ask yourself for a pay raise, all the other people has to agree. And then at the beginning, you've got all those kind of feeling like, no, I don't think so, which is harsh to hear from your peers, right? So I think you see like a very small amount of companies who are experimenting with it. Some of those might be doing it for 10 years now, like that one example. But some of the others might be starting it. If it's an ultimate goal, I don't think so. So I think most of the organization would have a blended model with some managers and a lot of leaders. So the goal is not to get rid of managers. The goal is to grow leaders in the organization. So we have more leadership and less management. Any other question? Uh, actually, we have one here. 
Uh, so some people started already using our tool, so great thing. Yeah, so if you want to ask question, just go to menti.com and add vo that code and you can write your questions. You also can like other questions and Susie can answer them. All right. So how do you introduce Agile mindset to other departments? I think you have to be good at listening for their needs and help them to understand what they need to change. How do they feel? Do they have a high enough sense of urgency? Or do they just feel everything is great, we are the best department in this organization? So after all, agile mindset change is a change like anything else, right? So you need to apply those change management practices like create a sense of urgency, generate the fast wins, etc. right? So I really start with a goal. Why would you change? Okay, there is a marketing. The marketing is not agile. Do they need to change at all? Because maybe they don't, right? Maybe they don't have to change. So then I would not implement it. On the other hand, if you look closer, there is always a better way how to do things. So there are always some pains which you can take out and help them to improve their way of working. So I would go through the strong purpose again. Great, but still if you have question, you can raise What hand. is easier to find, manager or a leader? <laughs> it's kind of a tricky question, but I think a leader. Because everyone here is a leader. So all we need to do is to make you be aware of that and grow you. If I'm looking for a manager, you have all this checklist of experiences, what they're looking for. If you look for a leader, it's much more simpler. You look for someone who is not afraid of stepping out and saying, okay, how about if I do this small thing? It doesn't have to be huge. So it's easier for me now. Maybe somebody from audience has questions. Practical no? and small. IT people. <laughs> I would start with your training of your mind. And I tell you what I did last year. I thought about myself. I've been starting some leadership program in Agile space, you know, certified Agile leadership uh, as a class, certified Agile leadership as a nine month program of development of leaders. And when I've been preparing for this, I've been going to several leadership programs around. And then I thought eventually, and that's my shorthand, you have to start with yourself, I said to me. So I was like, what do I really need to improve in myself? And I thought, well, maybe I just need to be more patient and curious. I can't change it because I say it. I'm too fast very often. How about if I just stay quiet and listen for a while and see what happens? So I make myself two post-it cards in front of my computer saying, like, be patient, be curious. So I see it every single day in front of me. And I've been trying to get better. Especially when I disagree with something, when I feel this is wrong. And it was hard to let it go. <coughs> but eventually, I got better. And so my advice is choose something like this and train yourself to be a better leader. <coughs> okay, last question. I guess we have two minutes left. And also we will have <coughs> some more slides with uh, feedback getting. So, yeah.
That's an interesting question. And just go there and talk to them. And I use, I think, two things. I use a strong, at certain point, I listen at the beginning to what they say and ask questions like, what do you think? And um, what is Agile for you? And why do you think this company is applying Agile? And what do you believe is Scrum about or similar things like that, right? And eventually, when I listened for some time and got a context and got some kind of image what they believe is Agile about, then I just tell them in a very sharp, clear way, well, sorry to say that, but this is not what is Agile about. And if you say it with a high confidence, not attacking, but high confidence, they usually say, oh, oh, really? So what is Agile then about? We thought it's this. And they are curious. And then I just can work with their curiosity and put up a story for them, like, it's about this, this and that, you know? Do you like it? They say, oh, we could imagine that. That sounds pretty appealing. But we dislike that thing. So that's the transition. It's about the storytelling. It's about ability to listen, ability to come up with a story which link their original question or image to the end one. And I think we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank Enjoy you, the Susan. conference.